If you have even a mild knowledge of World War II history, you've most likely heard of the Battle of the Bulge, an infamous battle in which nearly 12,000 American troops were surrounded by 54,000 Nazis in the Belgian town of Bastogne. Outside a little town nobody would ever heard of, named Bastogne, we dug in. The temperature was a record low, the fog was thick enough to slice. It was Christmas time, and the town was under siege. We dug in and held 24 hours a day while we waited for relief. A battle with so many valiant elements, it almost sounds fictional, but it was real, and so were the men who fought there. But according to the National World War II Museum, our World War II vets are dying at a rate of 492 a day. By that estimate of the almost 12,000 Americans who defended Bastogne, it's estimated that only about 600 are left. The amount of these veterans is decreasing every year, and as they go, so do their stories. So where can we find these veterans? The answer may surprise you. Meet Jean-Luc. About two hours west of Bastogne, he owns a restaurant in the town of Ott, called Attitude. And back in August, he served us up a lead with our dinners, without even knowing. He gave us a beer with a cartoon American troop on it, prancing with a helmet full of beer. Jean-Luc told us the story of the troop on the label, a 101st Airborne vet who gave aid to the wounded in Bastogne by bringing them beer in his helmet. So obviously in war, a lot of stories come out of it. Good, mm. bad, fake, true, nobody really knows. And this one sounds pretty fantastic. Do you think it's true? I'm absolutely certain it is true, because you can't make up a story like that. It has to be true. This guy going to a pub, uh, filling his helmet with, a, with beer to just, just to, to help his comrades who are about to die or heavily wounded or not. And uh, yes, I suppose this, this is a great story. It's, um, it's a, true, yeah. yeah, you want it to be true, and I'm, I'm pretty certain that it is. This story sounded too much like an urban legend. We had to find out if this troop actually even existed. If he did, was he still alive? Where does he live? And how have more people not heard of him? As soon as we got home, we scoured the internet to see what we could find. And surprisingly, we didn't find much. However, there was this one article that did stand out. Five years ago, a print journalist out of Springfield, Illinois, did a story on a man named Vincent Speranza, who claimed to be the fabled beer in the helmet paratrooper. But there was no information on how to find this Vincent character. Eventually, we just decided to call the journalist personally and see what he could tell us. He was able to hook us up, but the story was published five years ago. Who's to say Vince is even still alive? It was worth a shot. Two days later, I had a new message in my inbox from Vincent Speranza. It read, Dear Sir, yes, I am interested if we can work out a mutually agreeable schedule. Vince. It was vague, but it was all we needed. The man from the bottle was indeed a real person, and the stories were all true. Vince was already flying back to Bastogne for the 71st anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge with his granddaughter Ella, and we were going to meet him there. 71 years ago, Vince saw these hills from a foxhole. At the age of 90, he's seeing things a bit different. So I'm anticipating. What am I going to find? What am I going to see? What am I going to remember? The people of Bastogne remember Vince carrying a helmet full of beer. But Vince also carries a helmet full of memories. Uh, in a way, uh, we're using humor as a tool. Uh, get them laughing and talk about something and so on. And then they, they're, they're listening to the rest of the message. When I, when I speak, I, I talk about my early years and so on and so on. And I move right into uh, the war, the, the beer story, the, the funny uh, thing there. And I get, I get people laughing and so on and so on, but then I tell them about the rest of the world too. The real story, which as he revisits his foxhole, resurfaces. It was Jesus, am I really standing here where now, 70 years ago, I was a kid with a machine gun? Uh... Of all the memories that resurface from being here, what he remembers is the last talk with his father before the train left the station. I got on the train and, and he didn't say a word. But the train starts to pull out, for the first time I saw tears in my father's eyes. And he said, "Non fa mai una cosa e mi ricalavi la testa," which means, "Son, just don't do anything to make me hang my head in shame." And that came back to me when I was in combat. That that first day, among all the other things that I was feeling, I remember my father saying, and me saying, "I won't, Pop." He didn't. As a matter of fact, he was so effective with his machine gun that he earned the name Curse and Traverse Speranza for his choice language while pulling the trigger. But according to him, if you were a paratrooper in Bastogne, this was simply a part of the job that needed to be done. I accepted readily that, that uh, yes, there are good guys and bad guys, and really and truly, 
they're bad guys. And so I had no qualms about doing what we had to do. This was the first of many stops in a weekend which would prove that the beer store was only a small part of his mark on Bastogne, but it was still a part we had to see for ourselves. So we headed to the tavern where it all began. No, you see this? Only when we got there, it wasn't a tavern at all. It's a travel agency now. This was it, but they closed. This was a tavern, but it was all bond. And when I walked in there, you know, I was stepping over the wreckage and so on, but the bar was still good with a pull the handle that had beer in it. And, and this was the tavern when Vince found it, ducking from artillery as he poured his buddy a cold one. <laughs> I, 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 I did not pay any particular attention to the condition of the situation. <laughs> Only that beer came out when you pulled the handle. <laughs> and to most people, that's where the story ends. But it's just the beginning. To find out what comes next, we asked Ella what memory of Bastogne moves Vince the most. That would probably be the church. You know, it's hard to see him break down like that. He stays strong about so many other things. I mean, that one's, that one's tough. St. Pierre Church. It looms over the city of Bastogne as prominently as it does in Vince's memory, because this was the field hospital with his buddies and the final destination for his beer. If, during that entire 65 years, I ever did have any kind of back thought, it was that, it was that scene. As he took us inside, he froze. The memory of his first time back in the church stopped him in his tracks. And a, a woman, a little woman, old woman, with a little boy. And as I'm standing over there, she walks up to me with the little boy. And the little boy steps back and says, Sir, uh, thank you for our freedom. And he gives me the, the British salute. And the old lady reaches up and, and she, she wiped my tears. And she said, you complete. I understand. I fell apart. I couldn't talk for the next half hour. Seeing with those guys. The church has since changed, but his memories remain the same. Years later, you know, when I started thinking about it, I realized how stupid I was to bring beer in, into wounded, wounded guys. But I said to myself, if that guy laying on the floor they got an enjoyment out of a, a mouthful <laughs> of beer, you did the right thing. <laughs> then they held with the officers and yeah. they hollered at me about it. It was one of the visions that I tried like hell to put in the back, not, not look at, listen to, visualize again. Every time I think, you know, I'm getting over it, and I come back and I fall apart again. But that's, that's, that's the beer story, but not the funny part. The, the, the serious part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm happy that I'm able to visit it with you, Pop. Well. It's something else. But the beer story goes deeper. Deeper, perhaps, than even Vince realizes. Thirteen years ago, Vince suffered from a heart condition. Let's go. It got to the point where he, he just physically couldn't do it. Um, even asked my mom to like come in and play nurse. His heart had broken when Alzheimer's took the love of his life. The decline on my grandmother was, was hard. Uh, she essentially just stopped talking, which for him, that's his best friend and his partner. And for him to not only lose that, but the, the communication with her w was difficult. So he finally made the decision to, you know, put her in long-term care in a nursing home. And 
he sees her every single day that he's home. You don't call him, you don't schedule anything with him between 10 and 11 o'clock. <laughs> That's his hour with her, and even now that she doesn't really recognize him, he still goes every day. Fighting so hard to keep what was left of his wife, that he began to lose track of himself. About a year after putting her in the nursing home, he, he was, he was just sitting at home, waiting to go, that was it. She was the only reason why he got up in the morning, and now this is why he gets up every day. Because in the 65 years since Vince was in Bastogne, he'd become a legend, and he never even knew. That is, until his daughter convinced him that he needed a change, and it was time to return. That's when he met Marco. Every day I'm happy that I know him. He's a great guy to be around with. The Bastogne native who five years ago discovered that he had known Vince all of his life through stories. What was the look on your face when you heard that story? I, I knew the story, I was eight years old. And now I'm so 48 you know. years old. I was shocked by, I, I thought, what? <laughs> I remember all the time I thought it was a nice story. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a bullshit story, but you know, yeah. the war had a lot of bullshit stories. And I liked so it very, very much. So the same look that he had on his face uh, when it came out. Yeah. Well, hey. <laughs> He now, came now I am I am better known for what I did with a helmet full of beer than what I did with my machine gun during the whole war. He came home with that story, and we thought he was full of that, crap. Yeah. <laughs> Once a word got out that this Bastogne legend was a real person, Vince learned at the age of 85 what it means to be a celebrity. A beer dedicated to him with the helmet glass, knighted by the French government, his own exhibit at the 101st Airborne Museum, VIP treatment with the ambassador a published book at 89 and not even enough pens for all the autographs. And, to top it off... They're, they're doing one of these museum things where they do a wax thing of you. Right, right. General Patton and me. Yeah, you're going to up there next to General Patton? Oh, yeah. There's time on Monday. Yeah, they're, they're doing Monday, a general and a private. In the morning, everything is you know, I never okay. served under Patton. I want to do... Uh, I want to... So I just... More handsome than Patton, so they decided oh, yeah, to wait. put you on there. Yeah, Saturday evening, <laughs> I still, I can't wrap my head around it. You know, walking through the barracks like we did yesterday and it's just a mob of people. That will, I will never, ever, if I ever come back, I will still never get used to that because that's just so out of context for me. At home, he's, he's pop, you know, whatever. <laughs> with all this love, it would be hard not to recover as well as he did. But with this love comes responsibility. You, you won't experience it until you get old enough, but you, you, get, you get to a point where now, your family's doing well, everything's done, and you used to be a, a, a teacher or something, and then all of a sudden, you're nothing. And when you're nothing, you, you start wondering about, uh, uh, is there any value? Is there any way that I should keep living? <laughs> you know, and uh, when you no longer have even the responsibility for your wife, because she's in a, a nursing home and so on. But uh, this turnover, for me, as uh, enough people have convinced me that uh, maybe there's still a little value left and that I ought to continue. The responsibility that a living part of history has to share their knowledge. And so I feel satisfied that I'm making good use of my last years, <laughs> whatever I've got. I am prepared to go at any time, but while I'm still around, uh, I still feel this responsibility. But according to Vince, we all have a responsibility as important as his. My message is uh, get up off your backside and pay attention because we sincerely, those of us who have been through it, sincerely hope that you do not have to do the same thing. And uh, we certainly don't need to. It, you know, the, the saying goes over and over and over again, he who refuses to learn the lessons of history is doomed to repeat them. So respect the history, however you need to, to move forward as Vince does. Yeah. And, and sometimes you wonder, you know, why do I keep coming back? Why do I want to see all that stuff again? Or think about it? And the answer is, uh, the only way you can show respect for those guys is to... Come back. Yeah. Yeah, so that you still hope that... Uh, you could tell, tell the, the, the story to somebody else mm -hmm. and make them realize what somebody else wants.